All right, well, if you have your Bibles, open up to the book of Jonah once again this morning. Jonah chapter 1. Jonah chapter 1, as we pick back up on a series that we started a couple of weeks ago called Life Interrupted. Jonah chapter 1 this morning. And as you're turning there, I'm going to ask you a question. And I don't know if any of you will have seen this show or not. It's been around, not been on the air, I guess, for a few years now. But any of you familiar with the former Disney, Ch I'm sorry, Discovery Channel show that was called Mythbusters? Does anybody ever see that? Oh, well, got a couple people. Okay, all right. So let me just kind of sum up the show for you, okay? Basically, there's these two guys who have some very good training in both science and special effects. And the whole premise of the show was they would take theories and ideas or myths that people had heard and uh, sometimes even believed, and they would figure out how to test them out. And at the end of the show, they would declare a certain theory either to be fact or still myth, all right? Now, if that sounds boring, it's not at all, okay? Let me, like, let me give you an example, all right? This is one of my favorite episodes that they ever did, all right? They took the claim that paper armor could actually protect you just as much as metal armor, and they tested that out, okay? Now, if you don't know, paper armor was actually used by the Chinese people for centuries as a defense me me mechanism. And there are those who have claimed since that time, obviously not against the modern weaponry that we have today, but ancient weaponry, that paper armor really, really works. And so they decided, hey, let's give it a try, okay? And so they got regular pieces of paper, just like what you and I would use. They would fold those up into these blocks, and they made an entire suit out of paper armor. Put it on a dummy, and this is where it got really fun. At high velocity, they began to launch swords and spears and every other kind of metal weapon that you could think of against this thing, all right? They're just shooting these things, shooting these things, shooting these things, and they did the exact same thing to a dummy that they had in metal armor. Guess what? Paper armor really does work. They didn't believe that at the beginning of the show. In fact, every once in a while, they'll let these guys kind of, you know, put out their venture, their guess, what they think about it. And they were like, there's no way. No way that this is going to stand up. But they took the two dummies. They took the armor off them in the end. They compared the wounds and everything else, all the markings on them. And just about across the board, everything was the same. Conclusion, if you're in a real bind... Get a piece of paper, start blocking it up. You can make yourself some armor and you might be okay. All right, okay, that's what's going on, all right. Fact, not myth, all right. So, just a little interesting piece of information today because I realize, of course, paper armor has nothing to do with our lives whatsoever. But the reason I bring that up is because we are going to do a little myth busting of our own today. And here's the myth that we're going to be trying to see whether there's any truth to it or not from the Word of God. The myth that we're going to be testing is whether or not a real Christian can quote-unquote successfully sin and get away with it. Experiencing no problems, no consequences in the aftermath. And so I already know the answer to that. Well, maybe you do. But I have got to tell you right now, there are a lot of Christians who have a lot of strange ideas about sin and the way that it can or cannot affect and influence their lives. Now, I think most of us here today would agree with this. Sin is wrong. It separates us from God. It's deserving of punishment. And we need the saving power of Jesus Christ in order to see it broken in our lives. But after that, honestly, Christians sometimes get a little fuzzy about their thinking about sin. So before we look at Jonah today and what we're to learn from him here at the end of chapter 1, I want to begin today by actually noting some wrong ideas that Christians have had about sin, some of which honestly have been around for centuries. And here's the first one. There are people out there who believe, believe this or not, I am above sinning. 
Yeah, they do. They really, really do. There's a whole movement, actually, within Christianity that proclaims that. Yet, in the contest of talking about the sins of idolatry and immorality and avoiding those, you know what we're warned in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12? It says, therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Hmm. But there are people out there who believe that. I'm above sinning. Or some people, they kind of go to the other end of the extreme. And this is what they think about sin. I can sin all I want because God's grace is greater. That sounds like a great idea, doesn't it? I want to magnify God's grace. I want people to know all about who God is, how kind he is. And so I'm just going to do whatever I want and do it as bad as I can. The Apostle Paul took that on in Romans chapter 6. Again, this is an idea that's been around for a long time. In verses 1 and 2 in Romans chapter 6, he cries out and he says this. He says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? And his answer to that, by no means. How can we who have died to sin still live in it? Yet again, if Paul's got to record that in the word of God, he's led by the Holy Spirit to do that, it's because it was a real temptation that people were falling prey to and they're thinking about sin. I can do anything I want because God's grace is greater. It's a wrong idea. Here's a third one that we find in scripture. Some people think about sin this way. I can't help but sin. And Christians go around, and there are still people today who live incredibly defeated lives. You ever met a person like this? It's like some of us at the end of yesterday, all right? We're kind of hanging down to our knees here a little bit because we were just so tired, all right? But there are some Christians who live life like that. They are so overwhelmed by their sin, and they have convinced themselves, hey, I can't do anything else. Now, let's be clear. All right, the Word of God does make it clear to us. We are going to sin, and we are going to continue to battle against sin. We are going to continue to struggle against it this side of heaven. And yet you go to passages like Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 20, which encourage us there that we are, those of us with the mind of Christ, we're to put off the old man, we are to put on the new man who is created after the likeness of God, and guess what? True righteousness and holiness. That's who we've been made to be because of what Jesus has done for us. And if you keep reading in that chapter, in Ephesians chapter 4, and you go to verses 25 through 32, it actually gives us a great picture of this and what that means. If you stole, he says, steal no longer. Instead, be generous. Okay, you got mouth problems, he says, speak wholesome words. And on and on and on the list goes. In other words, sin doesn't have to control us. It doesn't have to defeat us in Jesus Christ. And yet there are still people out there who think about sin in this way. I can't help but sin. And let me give you one more this morning. Wrong ideas Christians have about sin. The last one we'll share is this. God doesn't care as much about the Christian's sin as he does about the unsaved person's sin. You ever met anybody who thought that way? I've come across a few. I call, it, kind of, I call it the decoy, all right? Basically what they're saying is, you know, pfft, I can magnify some person over here that I know doesn't know Christ, all right? They got bigger problems than me. God's going to be more concerned about them than he is about me and all the little piddly things that I'm struggling with. In fact, I will suggest to you right now, this is the wrong idea about sin that I think Jonah fell prey to and we're to see today as we head into that book in just a moment. But again, Scripture answers the strong idea. For instance, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19 notes that everyone who names the name of the Lord, we are supposed to depart from iniquity, okay? It doesn't say just a little bit. It doesn't say just maybe if you have more over here. No, all right? We're to draw that line. We're supposed to be moving away from sin because God has freed us from that. Or Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 6 so it's for the Lord disciplines the ones that he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. 
Tell you what, discipline's happening. That means something wrong has been done, and that means something is, God is concerned about that, and he wants us to move beyond that. You put all those things together, and this is what I think you find. Sometimes we find our lives interrupted by God because there's sin in our lives. Sin that we are not dealing with and God knows that he has to deal with because that sin is keeping us from becoming the holy people that he designed us to be. And I believe it's that lesson that we're going to learn from Jonah's adventure at the end of Jonah chapter 1 here today. If you look down at your Bibles, you'll remember that a couple weeks ago, we last left Jonah having just boarded a ship heading for Tarshish. Okay, Tarshish being the farthest most point away from where God wanted Jonah at that particular moment. All right? He is running from God. Despite having clear word from God that it revealed to Jonah the, what the will of God was, Jonah has actually made the foolish choice to disobey God and abandon his mission. So notice what God does next, beginning in verse 4. It says there, But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But, notice this, Jonah had gone down to the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. And so the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out on your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us so that we may not perish. Can I sum that all up for you? Here's the first thing we need to note today. God went after Jonah in his sin. God went after Jonah in his sin. Now I'm going to say, unfortunately, many of our English translations sort of hide that fact there in verse 4. Because they translate the beginning of verse 4 like this, that God sent out a great wind. Making it kind of sound like, hey, you know what happened? God just made a really great day for sailing, and these guys were making great time, and they were having a great trip, okay? No! That's not what this means at all. In fact, the Hebrew word is so much stronger than that, and I'm thankful the English Standard Translation has made that clear. Because the most literal translation of that word that most of you have is sent is the world, word hurled. If you are hurling something, guess what? You're throwing some effort into it, aren't you? <laughs> You're flinging it with great force and great intensity. That's what the word hurl means. I went home yesterday after Fall Fun Fest and uh, needed to sit down for a couple minutes, so I turned on the TV and found a ball game. And uh, I don't know if any of you guys saw this yesterday, but the Cleveland and uh, Tampa Bay game, baseball game, went 15 innings yesterday. Great baseball. It was bottom of the 15th, finally, the, the Cleveland team ended up hitting a home run and ended up winning the game. I mean, top-notch playoff baseball. But I got to tell you, one thing in watching that game I was reminded of was this. When a pitcher gets up there on the mound, he does not take the ball and just kind of lob it towards the plate and just say, hey, go ahead, crush it. I don't give a care, all right? He doesn't do that. Every single pitcher, and I saw a whole lot of them in the little bit of time that I was watching yesterday, when they threw the ball, they hurled it. Meaning they threw it with incredible intensity every single pitch, aiming for a very specific spot every single time. And that is the idea of what God is trying to tell us here in verse 4, all right? It says there again, look at it. It says, the Lord hurled a great wind after Jonah. Meaning... God is active in this. He has got pinpointed, passionate pursuit. And the way that he does that is actually by purposely bringing a massive storm into Jonah's life. God was coming hard after Jonah, and even in Jonah's sinful rebellion. 
And you need to understand This storm was not just some freak act of nature that was taking place. This was God at work. And this wasn't just like a little itty bitty storm, okay? It's not like one of those summer thunderstorms you get that's in and out in like five minutes. When you see it, it says, There was a mighty tempest on the sea in verse 4. So much so that the ship threatened to break apart. Guys, I think you'll appreciate this maybe more than what the ladies, but if you've ever worked with wood, you ever had that moment where you started to tighten something down and you start to hear that wood cracking, okay? That's what was going on with this. I think very few of us understand the intensity of a storm at sea and what it is capable of. But it can make a ship, especially a ship like that, in that day, which was made out entirely of wood, to seem like a toothpick. And that is what the storm was like, according to verse 4. The storm was so violent that it actually started to scare the ship's crew. And I have to remind you, this ship's crew was undoubtedly made of men who had been sailing for years, and they had seen it all. But their actions show how desperate this situation was. It goes on in verse 5 and it says, Then the mariners were afraid. Okay, And I have to say that's a little bit of an understatement for sure. Because their reaction tells you exactly how scared they were. It says, first of all, each of them got religious. Because it says in verse 5, they started to cry out to their God. All right. Now if you know anything about sailors, for the most part, they are not a religious bunch. They can be very, very heathen if you want to put it that way. And yet, in this moment, every single one of them is so freaked out, they're praying like no one else has prayed before. And then on top of that, it says, verse 5, it says, they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea in order to lighten it for them. And again, that kind of, to us, sounds kind of nonchalant, but you've got to remember, this was these people's livelihood. You showed up at the next port, you didn't have the cargo, you didn't have the goods, you didn't get paid. But these guys are so freaked out and scared at this moment, they are so frightened, they're like, who cares? Chuck it! Get it out of here! They're exhausting all their own human resources. But remarkably, the only one not shaken up by what was happening was Jonah. Because what's it say at the end of verse 5? What's he doing? Come on, talk to me. He's asleep. What? (laughs) How is it everyone else is fighting for their lives and Jonah's downstairs taking a nap? How does that work? Well, some people suggest sleeping for Jonah was a coping mechanism. That's how he's dealing with his guilt. That's how he was dealing with his fear. He was aware of what was going on, but he just kind of knocked himself out and make sure it didn't really bother him too much. Some people just say, you know what, he's probably tired. I mean... He had to pack up really quick. He had to run to Joppa. He had to leave his home. You know, he's trying to get away from God, and that just must have been exhausted. And, you know, he's laying down there at the bottom of the ship because he pooped out. Maybe. But my opinion, and I can't necessarily prove this, but this is just my take on it. My opinion is Jonah's nap reeks of a prideful, smug self-confidence that even though Jonah knew he was wrong and running from God, he kind of figured, you know what, God's going to forget about me because it's not going to be too long before God's going to turn his attention back to Nineveh and its sin. That's the bigger problem. That's what God is going to focus on. But even in his sleep, God pursues Jonah Because verse 6 says that God sends the ship's captain to pull Jonah back to reality with a heartfelt cry to try and help the situation by ironically praying to Jonah's God. (laughs) 
But I've got to stop there for a minute. And I've got to ask you guys to think through this with me. Could God have let Jonah just go on his merry way at this point? Yeah. I mean, could God have just written Jonah off, figuring, you know what, he's going to Tarshish, he can't do any more damage there, let's just let him go. Could have. Could God have just found someone else to go to Nineveh and to proclaim that message of judgment? Sure. But he didn't. Instead, God pursued Jonah despite the fact that Jonah had simply stiff-armed God. Why? I believe God loved Jonah too much to let Jonah just go down the destructive path that he had chosen. Just like God cares about you too much to let you easily embrace sin if you are here today and you are one of God's sons or daughters in Jesus Christ. I love how Hebrews chapter 12 and verses 7 and 8 describe this. They say this in the New Living Translation. As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Whoever heard of a child who was never disciplined by its father? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all his children, it means that you are actually illegitimate and not really his children at all. I want you to look at that for a minute. I want you to think about that. When I worked in the criminal justice system, one of the most interesting and saddening things I found was the number of incarcerated individuals who had no father figure in their life. Either physically or emotionally, that dad was not in the picture. You look up those statistics, they are anywhere from 75 to 95 percent of incarcerated individuals has that in some form or way, depending on how you break some of those numbers down. I can still remember one conversation I had with an inmate one day. I'd had a pretty good reputation with him and relationship with him. And he was talking with me about the fact that his dad was just never there for him. And how insecure he felt that every time that he did something wrong, his dad would never correct him, ever. People would come to him and say, why aren't you doing anything about your son? Why aren't you trying to step into his life? And he would just shrug his shoulders and he'd say, well, boys are going to be boys. And this guy concluded from that, he said, I just figured out my dad didn't care about me. I got to tell you all, that will never, ever be the case when God is your spiritual father. Because Hebrews chapter 12, verses 7 through 8, make it very clear to us, a mark that you truly belong to God is when he steps in and disciplines you. He, as your father, cares way too much about you not to step in and confront your sin because he knows that sin always leads to death. And I got to tell you all right now, if you are here today, God loves you. And he will pursue you to the ends of the earth using all of his infinite resources to bring you back to him if you were in sin. And I've got to plead with you, if that is the case, don't resist him when he comes storming after you and he interrupts your life. Instead, turn back to him. God went after Jonah because of the sin in Jonah's life. Well, as we continue on in the story there in chapter 1, it becomes pretty obvious the storm wasn't alleviating despite all the prayers and all the efforts that were being put forth by the sailors. And so they decided the next best step was to figure out who was the cause of the storm. 
So beginning in verse 7, we see how God not only went after Jonah, but God actually exposes Jonah's sin. Look at verse 7 there in chapter 1 of Jonah. It says this, And they said to one another, okay, this is the sailors, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. And so they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where did you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And notice Jonah's answer in verse 9. And he said to them this, okay? He said, I'm a Hebrew. And I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid, and they said to him, What is this that you've done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So let's go back up to verse 7 and let's talk about this whole casting of lots thing first, okay? All right? Jonah's awake by this time. He's been drawn in by everything that's going on, whether he wanted to be or not. But things are getting so bad in this storm and the sailors are so scared that they are going to lose their lives. They conclude in looking around this, okay, this is not just your average day out in the sea. This is not your average storm. They had seen storms before. And so they figure somebody here has done something wrong. And so they cast lots to figure out who that person was. Now the casting of lots was a very common practice in the ancient world that was used to determine some answer that was being sought. Usually that involved drawing different sized sticks or sometimes it was reaching in a jar and everyone would take out a stone and whatever one had the mark on it kind of was the one that determined that you were the person who was responsible, all right? That's what happens here with Jonah. Because it says at the end of verse 7 there, the lot fell to Jonah. So now all eyes are focused on him, all right? He has been called out. He has been exposed. But you need to understand that Jonah's exposure through that lot, that wasn't just a matter of luck. That wasn't just a matter of chance. That was actually the work of God that brought Jonah and his sin out into the open. And it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out something was really amiss in Jonah's life. I won't read all those questions there again, but you can kind of picture the sailors. Boom, 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 boom. I mean, we got rapid fire questions going off here. Who are you? What's this all about? Come on! Give us some answers. And Jonah replies to all that, and all his answers bring everything out into the light. He is running from God. He is the one responsible for the storm that they are all going through. Now, I got to tell you again. Some Christians don't believe that God would ever do something so quote-unquote mean as make my personal sin known to others. But I've got to tell you, sometimes I don't think God is left with a choice because he's got to do it in order to wake us up. There's a lot of examples in Scripture of that happening. Think about people like Achan, Joshua chapter 7, all right? He steals treasure from Jericho. You remember that? And it's when the time comes where they're trying to figure out why they just lost this battle, God said that someone did anything wrong. Remember, Achan had hidden it underneath the tent, and it took a whole process before they figured that out. God called him out, exposed it. David, 2 Samuel chapter 12. David, for a year, covers up everything that he's done with Bathsheba, the immorality that he has committed, the way that he killed Uriah. Everything in his life has just been cover up, cover up, cover up, cover up, until boom, God drags that out in the open because David wouldn't deal with it. Same thing happens in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 with the immoral Corinthian man. You go into the book of 1 Timothy, guys by the names of Hymenius and Alexander and Philetus, they are actually named specifically in Scripture for teaching, I'm sorry, for false teaching. I just got to say, if God was willing to do that for people like that, uh, he will do the same for us if that's necessary. Bring the sin out of the open. Expose it, just like he did with Jonah. Why? Well, again, Hebrews chapter 12, this time verses 9 and 10, kind of help us understand this. 
They say there, besides this, we have earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not be much more subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best for them. But notice this. He, speaking about God, disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. I gotta tell y'all, if you're here today and you were living an unrepentant sin, you got to understand God has a much better plan for your life than the sin and destruction that you have chosen. He wants you to be holy. He wants you to be like him. He wants you to be able to experience the best of life that he has for you because we are separated from sin unto all that is good. But when we won't confess that and we won't deal with that sin that's in our lives, that sometimes means that God is going to have to interrupt our lives and he's going to have to drag that sin out into the light to be seen in all of its ugliness. You say, well, how does he do that? Well, first and foremost, he does that through the word of God. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 talks about how the word of God is living and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And because of that, it is able to go into the deepest recesses of who we are and to expose us and everything that's there. And I don't know if you've ever had this experience where you know that you're doing something wrong in your life and one day you're reading the word of God and it's like, BAM! You hit that wall and you're like, man, that's right, I'm wrong. I need to deal with that. That's the work of God exposing sin. Sometimes God exposes their sin through painful circumstances. Again, a good example of that, Joshua chapter 7 with Achan. Man refused to confess, and in the end, he ended up losing his life. His family covered it up with him. Sometimes God interrupts our lives and he drags our sin into the light and all its ugliness through the use of other believers. And let me just tell you, there's no one who can be exempt to this. One of the great notes of interest, I guess you could say, here in the pastoral community here in the last month has been the exposure of a pastor by the name of Matt Chandler being caught up in some sin. I don't know if any of you know who Matt is, but he is the lead pastor at a church called the Village Church down in Texas. Maybe one of the best, best communicators of God's word in the entire nation. But about a month ago, he was asked by his elders to publicly announce he was having to step away from his job as preaching and teaching, at least for a temporary period of time, because they had discovered that he was caught up in a texting relationship with a woman there in his church that the elders looked at and got wind of and deemed as being unhealthy was the word that they used for that. I don't share that story because I want you to be down on Matt Chandler. But I want you to understand, when you have sin in your life and you are truly God's child, he's not just going to turn a blind eye to that. It doesn't matter who you are and how famous you are. He cares too much. And he cared too much about Jonah. Before we leave these verses completely, let me just note a couple of other kind of applicable lessons, I think, that are brought out here. If you look back at verse 9, Jonah's answer to the sailors' questions about who he was and what he was all about, and why he was in trouble, it's kind of interesting. Again, in verse 9, he said to them, he said, I'm a Hebrew. In other words, he identified himself as being part of God's chosen people. He says, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. I 
Everything about Jonah's statement there, theologically accurate, isn't it? Perfectly. In fact, in one short statement, Jonah actually distinguishes his God from all others by noting his God, Yahweh, is the maker of everything, not just the small g God of it. He says, God, my God, he made the land, he made the sea. But I've also got to point out to you there's a lot of irony in that statement, isn't there? Because what's Jonah doing right now? He's running from the maker of it all. Obviously, Jonah's facts weren't affecting his heart and his actions, were they? Again, strong warning to us when we think about sin. Faith has to connect to practice. It can't just be words. Let me also note, Jonah's sin, it kept him from being a blessing in these circumstances. Again, in verse 9, he mentions himself as being a Hebrew one of God's chosen people from the nation of Israel. And if you know anything about your Old Testament, you will remember that the nation of Israel was supposed to be a blessing to the pagans around them. They were supposed to be light. They were supposed to point people to God. And instead of doing that, in this moment, Jonah has actually become a curse because he has drug all these other people into this storm and has put their lives in jeopardy. Another reminder, sin never affects just you. Other people always get caught in the undertow and they always get pulled into the pain no matter how hard you try to keep it to just you. I mean, the bottom line is this. Either you can affect this world positively for Jesus Christ by obeying him or you can hurt the name and the cause of Jesus Christ to call all people to himself and to redeem them when you choose to sin. I got to ask you, do you make the boat that you are on better or worse off? So, so far... Jonah's sinful escape plan isn't working out too well, is it? But God's still not done with Jonah. He's pursued Jonah in his sin. He's exposed that sin. But he still had to get Jonah into a position to deal with his sin by repenting. And that's what verses 11 through 17 are really all about. The story continues in verse 11, and it says this. It says, Then they said to him, okay, this is the sailors, they're talking to Jonah. What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? All right? Logical question at this point, right? We're about to die. You're the problem. Help us out with this a little bit. Because it says in the end of verse 11, The sea grew more and more tempestuous. So notice verse 12. He, speaking about Jonah, said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Now I've got to stop right there for just a minute. Okay? I realize you have all heard those words probably 10 billion times if you know anything about the story of Jonah. Coming right out of Jonah's mouth. But here's my question for you. How did Jonah know how to answer them like that in that moment? What should we do, Jonah? Pick me up, throw me overboard, everything will be okay. How does he know that? You ever thought about that? I believe it's a prophecy. I think God somehow keys Jonah in on that moment. This is what's going to happen. This is how it's going to work. 
I don't know how else Jonah would have known that at that moment. But verse 13 goes on and says, Nevertheless, the men rowed hard. Literally, they dug in the oars to try to get back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, and they said, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and let us lay not on us innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. And so in the end, they end up doing what they had to. Verse 15, it says, They picked up Jonah, they hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. And notice the effect that that has. The men feared the Lord exceedingly, verse 16 says, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and they made vows. And verse 17 concludes the chapter, notes this, The Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So let's start here, okay? Let's give these sailors some credit. These guys actually show more care and compassion for Jonah than what he did for them. And he's supposed to be the good guy. But the scripture says their efforts were to no avail, and the sailors are actually forced to follow Jonah's prophetic instructions, and they throw them into the sea in order to save themselves. And it worked. I mean, can you picture me and those sailors for just a minute? Okay. You're chucking the guy. He goes up. Boom, he goes down. And you're watching and also, whew. Really? It worked. Verse 17, that was where I really got to draw your attention for a minute. Notice again there what it says. And the Lord, my translation has the word appointed. Some of you have the word prepared. A great fish to swallow up Jonah. Appointed or prepared. In other words, God had gotten everything ready to miraculously spare Jonah's life. And most of all, Forced Jonah to consider the extent of his sin and where that had gotten him at that moment. Remember, Jonah thought he could get away from, by sinning and running from God. Instead, God now has Jonah exactly where he wanted Jonah. Where he could deal with Jonah's heart. Far from being a thing of punishment... That fish was actually an incredible act of grace from God in Jonah's life. One last time I reference Hebrews chapter 12. And it's instruction on discipline of those who are believers in Jesus Christ, who belong to God. It says in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 11, it says, For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. I think if we had Jonah standing here today next to me, <laughs> And we were to ask Jonah, you know, is this verse true? He'd be like, oh yeah, 100%. We'll talk about this more, all right? But his little trip in the belly of the whale or fish or whatever it was, okay. In the words of Hebrew 12, it was um, probably a little painful, to say the least. And when God has to step into our lives and he's got to discipline us, it doesn't always seem like a whole lot of fun. But I got to remind you all, God's not concerned about you always living and having fun. He's not always concerned about you just being comfortable and enjoying life. 
His goal is to train us to be righteous, it says there in Hebrews 12, 11. To do what is right like he does. And sometimes that means he has to interrupt our lives and allow pain into them so that we can come out better positioned to do right on the other side after we learn our lesson. And there's a lot of ways he can go about that. I mean, you look at David and his writings, Psalm 32, Psalm 51, after he sinned, he talks about the physical and the emotional discomfort that God sent in his life in order to get, gain his attention. Remember Moses? Somehow he knows. He is the redeemer. He is the one who's going to lead the people of Egypt, I'm sorry, Israel, out of Egypt. And yet he jumps the gun, he kills the Egyptian, and so what does God do? He isolates him in the wilderness for 40 years. There's two guys I mentioned earlier, Hymenius and Philetus. All right, kind of fun names to say. They weren't good guys. In fact, the Word of God says because of their false teaching, they were, had to be handed over to Satan. I don't know what that means, but I can tell you it wasn't good. <laughs> This thing, my lack of finger, that was God's discipline of me at the age of 18 because I had this idol in my life called sports. The good news in all of this is when you let God have his way with your heart after he positions you to deal with your sin, you will be amazed at how much better your relationship with him will become and what amazing things that he can and he will accomplish through you for his glory. And we're going to see that happen with Jonah. But notice, again, God's grace in Jonah's life. He positioned Jonah to deal with with a sin. And that leads us back to the original question that we began with today. Is it truth or myth that a Christian can successfully sin? I think it's pretty clear based on the word of God <laughs> that it teaches this that that's a myth. A myth that we can be thankful is true because God loves us beyond our wildest dreams. He's not just going to let you go. He's not just going to let you be successful in sinning. So if you find yourself here today and your life is being interrupted because of your unconfessed sin. Won't you stop pursuing that myth and instead return to the loving arms of your Savior? I got to tell you, that is the interruption that's worth experiencing. And that's what we'll see next week as we continue in the story of Jonah. And Father, I just thank you again for the opportunity to open up your word. And to see truth. We are just again indoctrinated all the time with so much myth, so many lies, so much things that are just take us away from where we need to be in our relationship with you. And sometimes, like Jonah, we let our sin begin to rule our lives. But thank you that you never stop coming after us. Thank you that you care enough to discipline us when we're your children. Thank you that because of the blood of Jesus Christ, anything that we ever do wrong is paid for and can be covered and can be forgiven. And Lord, I just want to pray for anyone here today who might be living in unconfessed sin. 
Maybe no one else knows it, but you do. Maybe there's someone in our lives that we know who's in that position right now. Help us not to stop praying for them. Help us to not stop standing by them. Help us not to stop speaking the truth to them. Because maybe we're going to be the instrument that you're going to use to expose that sin in their lives and to bring them back to you. Lord, thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for being relentless in your pursuit of us. May we just be as relentless in coming after you. We pray these things in Jesus' name this morning. And all God's people said.